Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about something that needs to always be made clear when we are talking specifically about stimulating hypertrophy in a muscle. And that is that the muscle itself doesn't particularly care about the source of the stimulation. And I'm not saying performance isn't impacted by this. I'm not saying intramuscular coordination or joint angle specificity or any of these things are not impacted by it. Because they are. They matter for this stuff. They matter a lot. But when it comes purely to stimulating a muscle to grow, and this is something that every single one of us who train are hopefully trying to stimulate to a greater or lesser degree. We are all generally trying to make muscles bigger unless we have a specific reason not to. Very true for me as a strength athlete and a strength coach. It's very true. In fact, we're generally seeking very large amounts of hypertrophy, very similar to the way that a bodybuilder would. And we want to get bigger. Most athletes who need to be strong are seeking to get bigger. Whether it's an MMA fighter, a boxer, a football player, a rugby player, they're generally trying to gain muscle. A shot putter, they're trying to gain muscle. So it matters for all of them. Now, people say, well, what about a weight class? Well, they still make weight. Like, get, maximizing muscle growth doesn't necessarily preclude you from a weight class sport. Keeping in mind that there are other things happening there. there your structure, your frame. Of course, there are ways to make weight involving losing body fat. Right? You, you generally don't want to outgrow your weight class, but usually weight class is a, is a height class in disguise. But that's another topic entirely. Let's get over to the point. Most of us are trying to gain muscle. Now, the guy who's just focusing more on body composition, and I don't like to cater to that guy. You guys know me. I don't care. He usually says, well, what about purely for this? But I don't care. I'm not interested in helping that clown because he is a clown. And that's how I view those who only care about their physique. But, that aside, that aside, the idea is still the same, isn't it? They're trying to gain muscle. Someone who's even wanting to lose body fat, we are trying to gain muscle. You're trying to gain muscle in the gym. It's why you're lifting weights, because more muscle will generally equal a higher energy turnover. And if you're stimulating muscle, you are losing less muscle, which means you're losing more body fat on the same amount of calories, right? Because if you lose five pounds of muscle, that's five pounds of fat that you didn't lose. That's energy that could have been spent burning off extra lard off of you that instead took muscle tissue off. And that's not ideal for someone who wants to lose fat either. So, so generally speaking, we're all trying to gain muscle. And here's the thing. Muscle doesn't care how you stimulate it. That's why there is no best rep range for hypertrophy. That is why there is no best exercise. Okay, so when someone tells you literally that this is the best exercise for this muscle, you know that they are full of shit. That's what the cumulative scientific and strength coaching evidence shows that anyone who tells you that is full of shit. That's gimmicky nonsense. There is no best exercise for building a muscle. Are there exercises that are probably better than others? Yes. But guess what? That can vary a little bit from person to person, can it? Assertions, levers, moment arms... In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Now, some people say, but Jason, haven't you said that there are certain things that have to happen in order to maximize muscle, certain muscles? Yes, absolutely. Hamstrings are a perfect example, right? Something I spent a lot of time discussing in training. I mean, obviously, you don't see me doing good mornings with over 500 pounds without pretty jacked hamstrings. I do deficit deadlifts with over 600 pounds. And there's a lot of hamstring involved in that. So I care a lot about hamstrings. But yes, you actually need both the hip and the knee to move to fully recruit the hamstring. A hip hinge alone won't do it. It can cover most of it, 
you know, we could argue about radiant effect. So yes, there, there is that, but is there only one way to get both? No. I love the glute ham raise, and I've been quoted as saying the glute ham raise is probably the most perfect hamstring exercise ever. Added as a supplemental lift, because it works all the functions of the hamstring, particularly the function in the head that gets neglected on hip hinging. But I say that because it has its own ways to load it, its own versatility, its own modalities. Could the exact same stimulation occur with a machine or a band? Uh, yes, yeah, it could. So is it really the best? No. It's a phenomenal tool. I own a glute ham device worth every penny. I love it when my clients have access to one in their gyms, right? But is that the only way that those functions of the hamstring can be hit? No, there are machines and cables and everything that can replicate at the hamstring level. That effect. You may not get some of the other benefits. You may not get some of the specific loadings and joint angles involved that we might want from a performance perspective. But could you still stimulate all those heads of the muscle to grow on a machine? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's coming from someone who's not particularly fond of machines. I think there's a handful of machines that are great. I don't like most of them. But is it possible to replicate largely the hypertrophic benefits of the glute ham raise with a machine? Sure it is. Let's come over let's talk about rep ranges. The same thing. Guys want to say things like, well, this is the hypertrophy rep range. That is a very, very, very outdated concept. It has been debunked with research. Does it mean that the old hypertrophy rep range isn't good for hypertrophy? No, because that's the problem you have. You know, people will, will discuss something like that and they'll say, but it worked for this guy, right? Because there's six different things that work. It's just one of them. The problem becomes when you think that it's better. Okay, do we see where we're going with that? If we say that a muscle doesn't care which of these following things you use, that they all can pretty much do what you want them to do, and you list six things, and you pick number two off that list of six, and say, but this works amazingly well, and this is traditionally how it was done, and I know, guys, you got good results. Okay. Well, that still fits with what we're saying. Because it's one of the six things on that list. You picked one of the things off that list. Yes, it will work. Of course it will work. It just doesn't work any better than the others. Okay, rep ranges. Mm, they seem to be pretty pretty widespread of what sort of rep range can induce maximum hypertrophy in lab looking at it in real people. Are the modalities a little different for each one? You bet they are. Do certain exercises lend themselves better to different rep ranges than other? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very complex structural exercises don't always lend themselves very well to high reps. We've got to look at stimulus to fatigue. What do I mean? How about a back squat or a barbell deadlift? A conventional deadlift, right? I think either one of those work particularly well with 12 to 15 reps. Best of luck to you programming that regularly. Not the best use of those exercises. I don't even like to do more than one rep on a conventional deadlift. I'll do deficits for rep work. I don't think it's a good use of training economy. Does it mean that high reps on it wouldn't stimulate a lot of muscle growth? Of course they can. Come back over to certain other movements. I think a bicep curl or a dumbbell tricep extension that you should be doing one rep maxes on them or even heavy triples. Even heavy fives can be problematic. And we know that threes and fives can stimulate maximum hypertrophy in studies, just as well as tens. Mm, those are not necessarily the safest exercises in the world. Single joint movements for very, very low reps. Again, problematic. It's problematic. From a joint health perspective, from an injury risk perspective. Okay. But the muscle doesn't care. As long as you don't get hurt, the muscle won't actually care realistically. 
but it's not practical, is it? So a lot of these things that we're, we're talking about as far as hypertrophy, they're about practicality. What movements are practical for you? Uh, what, do you what equipment do you have access to? How does it practically fit into the grand scheme of your larger training? Okay. There are no best exercises. There are no best rep ranges. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all for, for stimulating muscle growth. A lot of it comes down to a matter of what works in your larger program and what's a practical consideration in your situation. Those are far, far more important factors than figuring out, hey, what's the best exercise? Muscle doesn't care. You could literally change exercises every week and as long as the stimulus is the same, you could do 37 different exercises and still stimulate maximum growth. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but you could do it if you knew how to get it flowing correctly. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.